Let us pray. Oh Lord, help us to abide with you. Lord, the hour has come that your name must be glorified. Father, we have gathered once again to hear from your Lord, to understand the prophecy you've written down before the world began. Father Lord, give us grace to interpret your word, to teach your word, and to give it a meaning in the life of people. Holy Spirit, nobody can better interpret the word of God than you do. You were with us before the beginning. You understand the foundation of the world. And the hidden things belong to you. The thing you reveal belongs to us. Tonight, with your grace, open our eyes to divine wisdom and revelation. Give us insight into your world. As many that will be trying one way or the other to make sense of the prophecy of tonight. Lord, open their eyes to behold your understanding. To understand your grace and your glory. And let your word be made perfect in their life. Lord, bring strength to every weakness. Bring hope to every hopelessness. Bring vision to every life that is meaningless out there. Give grace to the graceless. Bring peace to those that are trouble-minded. As many that are sick, give your divine healing. Holy Spirit, teach us the word of God. Make known to us the scripture. For we know that all scriptures was ordained by God for men. Tonight, make known to us your understanding. Hidden things belong to you, O Lord. But the revealed thing belongs to us. Reveal your mystery through us tonight. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We thank God for such a wonderful night as this. We bless his name because of whom he is. He is the Lord, and that is his name. His glory will he not give to another, nor his praise be given to either. Tonight, we have gathered together for one honest teaching. The teaching that you have all been waiting for. Last week Sunday, we look into the church. That is the mother of all church, the church of Pagamos. But this week, we are still focusing on the church. Letter to the churches in the book of Revelation. And this week, we are taking a prophetic look at the church of Smyrna in the book of Revelation. Tonight, our text shall be taken from Revelation chapter 2, from verse 8 to 11. And which is letter to the church of Smyrna. But before we come back to the text, I want to give you a background teaching of what the Smyrna church was actually about. How does it matter to us? After all, we are no longer in Smyrna. Smyrna has now adopted a new name, which is Turkey. So we can no longer call them the church in Smyrna because they are, they are all now Islam. So how do we bring the word of God into this platform? We only understand that God sinned is justified in his people. The church in Smyrna was one of the seven churches John wrote to in the book of Revelation. And this letter was written by Christ and was signified to John, one of the born servants of Jesus Christ, to hand over to the seven churches that are in Asia. One of these churches was Smyrna. But before we start, I want a recap of what we studied last week. The letter to the seven churches describe the actual condition in each church at the end of the first century AD. However, the letter also prophesied about the future. The seven churches were geographically arranged in sequence on a more route in western manner of modern 
Asia Minor of modern Turkey. Scholar realized that this sequence portrayed seven eras of God's churches, from the days of the apostles to the end of the age. The church condition described in the letter prophetically described the condition that will prevail in each successive era. John addresses the book of Revelation to the seven churches, indicating that the letter to each church were to be read in all churches. Thus, the third purpose of the letter is to convey universal lesson that describes and deal with the universal human tendency. We need to understand that these letters are not just statements from Christ to each of these churches, but it's a universal lesson to Christians of seven generations. And these seven generations are seven churches. We have a letter engrafted to our own present day church, which is the last generation which is the church we will be dealing with at the end of the seventh week of this teaching. This church proposes each a geographical pattern, the characters of each church, the age, the events that follow, the persecution, the embodiment, all were covered in advance by Christ. And this tells us that Christ did not only know the events in each of the church age, but he is in control. He knows indeed our work. He knows what we have done. He knows our strength. He knows our weakness. There is no secret we can hide from him. Having known this, Christians ought to be so careful. That's what the Bible says, if we know the terror of the Lord, we will persuade men. If we know that Christ knows about our job, all our secret dealing, all of our private gist and discussion with our family member, with our friend, with our colleague at work, the kind of Christian we claim to be in the church, and the kind of Christian we are outside that the pastor may not even know about, how will our life be different when we know that God is not a God that is far away? That is also a God that is at hand. That God that sees our secret thoughts and knows our hidden thoughts. That knows what we think in our hearts, act, or even before we bring it to pass. God knows all about this. And that's why this letter was addressed to the churches prophetically, describing the condition that will prevail in each of certain era. John addressed the book of Revelation to the seven churches for this case. He indicated that the letter to each church were to be read in all churches. Why would he do that? Because the letter was not addressed to a particular church in particular. Because that's why the letter carried a phrase, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that has an ear. The lessons in these letters is not proposed for a particular church, but for everyone that has ear to hear. For everyone that has understanding. For everyone that can reason with their mind, they should understand what the Spirit of God is speaking about to each of the church generation. And he is saying to the seven churches, why did God specifically pick seven churches in Asia Minor? Because this were real church, they have real purpose, and these qualities were found in them. And their geographical pattern indicated that such character and geographical placement was placed based on these attributes that Christ referred to. Indicating that the letter to each church was to be read in all the churches. And the third purpose of the letter is to convey universal message that describe and deal with universal human tendency. That we need to understand what this letter revealed about the errors of the churches especially our modern era, and how their lessons apply to us today. Like for example, what we studied last week, letter to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was lost, lost its first love. Why would 
Christ referred to such a giant apostolic church that is the mother of all churches who were sound in doctrine, who were mandatory and forceful in the gospel to have lost their first love. Ephesus was a leading city, was a leading church. The church of Ephesus or the officials, they was a leading city in Asia Minor, but was it was a state of decline. The official church is symbolic of apostolic era of the first and second century AD. This church is commended for its works, the preaching it preached the gospel, it endured hardship, serving by the early apostle himself in Revelation 2 verse 1 to 3. And when they had to design between false teachers and true Christian ministers, however, they passed. They passed the test without any trouble. However, like the fading glory of Ephesus, the church at the end of the first century was told that you've left your first love. Because love is the center of our Christian faith. Without it, Christianity does not exist. If you were in our Tuesday lesson last week, we told you that no leader survived without love. Because love is the center focus of Christianity. There is no Christianity without love. And the official church here, we are guilty of losing that particular love. Not the kind of lost, full love we have in the world. But what we are talking about is the love of God that passes human understanding. The love of God that is one-sided. Not because we love God, but because God loves us. And he gave himself for us. That we should also love the church and give ourselves for, on behalf of the church. But many Christians today do not understand that this significance of such a wonderful love that Christ has left for us. But the Ephesians, they learn it in a hard way. They were in dire quest of God's judgment. God even threatened them that if they don't return to the purpose why he set up the church, to love their neighbor as they love themselves. Not only to love their enemy or to hate their enemy, but this love is beyond that. Not only to love God, but to love his follower as well. This was what the Ephesians was guilty of. They were the apostles. They have labor. They have devotion. They can attest to every biblical doctrine. They wrote the Bible we follow. But something was missing. The love of God that passes human understanding was missing. They have it at salvation. The love of God that drove them to repentance, they left it behind. Now we have grown beyond that. We want to go beyond salvation, to resurrection of the dead, to liberty of the saints, to healing the sick, to doing great work for God. Don't be so busy for the master that you forgot the master. And that was exactly what happened here. And they were so busy doing the work of the master in the sense that they disregard the master who owned the job in the first place. As a result, they have an embodiment for them. And Christ told them they left their first work. And their work accommodation now has a bot. They have an excellent commendation, but bots came in at the end of the day. So Christians, my advice to you is to take a lesson from the efficient church. Don't have a box in your life. Let your ways please God in everything. Because when you please God, you should not only please Him in some certain area and forget the key attributes. They felt love for my enemy, love for people who are not even Christians, are not important. After all, I am saved. I am on my way to heaven. But look at what Christ said. Because you left that particular love for your lost soul, 
The same love that God had towards you in the beginning, that made him converted you. I will also spill you out of my life. I will also remove you, your lampstand, from his place. That means you will not be part of my church. So, if you don't want your lampstand to be removed from the house of the Lord, you don't want your spirits to be taken out of the presence of God, you need to go back to your first love, unlike this church. So let's get back to our today teaching. Our today teaching is the smana. Smana, what does it stand for? It stands for man. When man is crushed, it brings forth arrows. So smana stands for trial, faithfulness in time of trial. Christian sweetness come out in trial. When Christians are being persecuted, they bring forth fragments, aromas. That means their faith actually grow in trial. Christian faith does not weaken in trial. Christian faith grows in trial. The trying church always survives. And this church symbolizes the missionary church. Smyrna was the missionary church. Unlike Ephesus, they did not bow out of their first love because they were being persecuted, because their host ties was much. No. The church of Smyrna offers another powerful and timeless lesson. Smyrna was prosperous, bustling, beautiful, plant pots. But Christians were faced with considerable persecution. When you think, oh, I am in a dwelling place, take for example European Union and all the rich continent of the world, you will not you will be happy to be a Christian in Africa or even a minister in Africa than to be a minister in the European Union or any part of the world where they have words. Because why? When words increase, persecution of Christians intensifies. When they tend to have earthly goods, then the persecution will be more. Some people think when money increases, the gospel can go faster, but that's not true. I'm sorry to disappoint you. When money increases, persecution of Christians go up. Because to the poor, God is his everything. To a rich man, God is only the creator. And so, he has no need of God after God has created him. He can buy his mercy for himself. He doesn't need deliverance because he has psychiatric. He doesn't need healing because he has medical insurance. And he doesn't even need financial blessing or breakthrough because he can get them from work or for social benefit. So God to him is only a tool needed in the creation. But no longer available or in some cases God is dead. Now, all that is left is him, his prospects, his riches, his greatness. But something was stranger than that. Smyrna era appeared to cover the third and fourth century AD. This was a period of intense Roman persecution. A period of ten kings in the Roman Empire. This king, their focus was to persecute Christians. The Romans came back from the Persian War and they brought disease with them. When there is no more person to bring the disease upon, it will blame upon the church. And it was used as a tool to persecute Christians. And Christians were being hunted for sports and being given to gladiators as a tool full of their uncleanliness. Why the Smyrna's errors commends for its work and being rich in faith. In Revelation 2 verse 9, it ought to be faithful until death. Faithful until death. What kind of faith will a believer have that will wait until death? You know, some Christians are very good in bowing out when there is trouble. 
We really praise God when things are rosy. Things are blessed. We give glory to God. Oh, to God be the glory. What of when things are bad? Can you sing the amazing grace when the enemy are at your back? Do you sing praising the Lord, praising in the sanctuary places when the only child you have in the world just died? Or do you blame God for the death of your son or your children? We're in an advanced country where 95% of the error in the world is blame on God. They don't have any other person to blame. They only to blame the man who they feel cannot defend himself, and that is God. But they fail to understand that the Bible says, it says the Lord God of us will do nothing. He's not going to do anything. He's going to reveal the secret to you. Because all he owns you is to increase your knowledge so you can solve your problem. But you cannot get that knowledge except you go to him and ask. And that's why God will reveal the secret to his servants, the prophets. But today we have prophets who are busy looking for God. Busy looking for church to pastor. Rather than to wait upon the Lord so that the secret can be revealed to them. But the secret can only be revealed to prophets who sought the face of God. And Christians are urged to be faithful until the point of death. Your Christian faith should not depend on circumstance. When things are rosy, like Saul. Saul was a good man. He was an honest man. But something happened in his soul life. He valued the people more than he valued God. And he paid the dearest price for it. There are so many pastors today, their message are always sweet. When the congregation is many. And when the congregation are just about few, eight or seven people, the message is done. That is because there is no motivation. But God is telling you to be motivated until the point of death. When everybody deserted you, your family deserts you, your friends desert you, even your ministry deserts you. No wonder so many pastors are so terrified of confessing their sin that they are willing to go to hell. That is because they knew they don't have members. All they have are lips in the midst of the church. They are multitudes. They will not stand by their ministers when things go wrong. They will be the first to be pressed to launch criticism against the church. That's why they will be a member of the same church. And such people are the missed multitude. The same people deserted Christ when he was on earth. All he told them is said to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life in you. But be anything they don't understand the rights, the fact. And they said, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? But the two did sit, they did hear it, they did understand it. What they don't understand, they ask questions. But the multitude would jump to conclusion. They can say in every matter. Because knowledge inside their head tell them what to do. They don't need God's counsel. They, they are no longer like Daniel, who when he don't understand things, he took it to the presence of God in prayer and supplication. Message that his heart, that he may hear and understand what is the mind of God concerning that situation. What did Daniel do? When the king has a dream, Daniel did not know what the king dreamed about. Neither has he entitled the king dreams to be able to tell his dream or the interpretation thereof. But he knew there was a God in heaven. But today, how many Christians knew there is a God in heaven? The God that revealed mystery. That secret thing belongs to that God. And the things that are revealed, they belong to us. How many Christians today will look at their situation and will say, this is not the thoughts the Lord has towards me. What does the Bible say concerning God's thoughts? He said, I know the thought I, talk to, I think towards you, says the Lord. They are thought of peace. They are not of evil to give you an expected end. But what happens if your end are not a desirable end? Do you just fold your hand and cry after all God has forgotten me? So let me also give up. God never forgets his people. He said to you in the book of Isaiah, Can a mother forsake her suffering child? That she will not even have compassion on the child of her womb? He said, Though she may forget, but I, your father, will never forget you. 
That is to extend that God is with him. Even if a mother can forsake her suckling child, but God himself will not forsake you. That is how hard it is. So if you knew that God cannot forsake you, why do you give up even before the time is over? Before the days are half spent, you've given up on the Lord. You just give up. Why do you give up on God? Why do you look upon Him as if He cannot help? A woman, Abraham's wife, Hagar, when she was about to lose her son, he said, I do not want to see the death of the child. He rather hid his face from the death of the child rather than to call upon God. But thank God, God met him her at that very point in time. And God saw her tears. And God showed her that there was a well in her front that he has provided. That before Abraham gave her a cruise of water, God calculated the distance. That that cruise of water would last and he put a well there. But how many of you even understand that before your last bread in the heart is spent, there is already food coming on the way? How many of you understand that before your job, that the manager so hated you wants to take him away, that you are doing everything, even lying to protect, that God has provided a job better than that job at the end of that job? He's, because he will not come to your ear and whisper it, does not mean the offer does not exist. That's why without faith, it is impossible to please God. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Christians should learn to wait. Be faithful unto death. Some people will look at a herbalist and they will rebuke the herbalist and they will depart from them. And the same man that just rebuked a demonic herbalist that is stronger than 300 gunmen and does stand for all of them, when he see only a bullet man and the beauty of the gun, he will fight even before they start. They have not shot him already, he's already dead. The question I want to ask you, the God that saved you from the hand of the demon who is stronger than the herbalist, the God that see you raise the dead. The God that you lay hand on that boy and he just recover. The God that delivered you from all the trouble throughout your age. Do you think he will abandon you to die in the hand of just that bullet? If he can save you from all this trouble, what is that bullet that God cannot save you from? But because your faith is small. That's why God told you, if you faith in the days of adversity, your strength is small. So be faithful unto death, and you will have the crown of life. For you to have the crown of life, you need to hold your faith in death. If not, you will never be able to earn the crown of life. Oh, I, I want to live. I don't want to die. There are millions of churches in Africa. They open from Monday to Saturday. All for prayer for people that don't want to die. They want to live forever. All right. What shall they profit a man? If you shall gain this whole world and lose your soul at the end. They don't want to die. They want to live forever. But here is Christ telling a church, the smiler church, that they should be faithful unto death. Nobody would think, why would God not rescue them? Why would God allow his servant to die? I thought these people were sent. Yes, they are. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord are the deaths of his saints. When the saints die, heaven rejoices. Heaven celebrates the deaths of the saints. Why would heaven celebrate the death of the saints? Because the death of one sin, of hundred cents, is better to God than the death of one sinner. Because God does not delight in the death of a sinner. Because when that soul dies, it's lost forever. But when the sense is lost on earth, it's a plus in heaven. So because of that, God will not intervene. 
God allowed that child to die at a premature age because he wanted to preserve his destiny ahead of him. God allowed that man who has been a good man all his life to die because he wants him in a better place. God allowed that woman to die with that child so that they will not fall into that sin that is coming tomorrow. You don't know why. That's why he told you his ways are not your ways. Neither are his thoughts your thoughts. Stop judging God. If you have all your questions, reserve it to the end. We believe because he's a fair God, he has set a day of judgment. And whenever you have a case, like Job did, Buckle it up. Even when Job wife came to Job, said, Do you still hold on to your infirmities? That's why he was covered in boil. Do you still hold on to your integrity? Why not curse God and that? But what did Job say to the wife? Why do you speak as one of those stupid women? Why do you speak like one of those people who lack understanding? Shall we receive blessing of the Lord? Shall we not also accept evil? Shall we receive holy glory, health, blessing, prosperity, and also and not also accept sickness and pain and suffering and even death? Don't want eat all this thing you see. I will get a new one. Though my flesh be wrecked within me, yet in this flesh I will see God. Though my reins and everything in me be consumed within me, yet in my flesh I will see the Lord. And when I see him, I will be able to present my case before God. My judgment is between me and God. And he endured, and he saw him that was invisible. So, if you can hold on to your integrity, your case will have a fair hearing. <laughs> Do not judge after the flesh. Because God is not mock concerning his promise. Whoever can't mockery in the sight of God is a long suffering to the person, not to God. In order to receive reward, they must wait to get. Because that generation was perfect. They did their work. And their crown was not on earth. Because God did not promise them a kingdom on the surface of the earth. I'm sorry to tell you Christians who are running around in our churches, pray for financial breakthrough. Christ did not promise you any kingdom on the surface of the earth. In this world you will be blessed because Abraham blessings are yours. You will be blessed in the morning, you will be blessed whenever you go out. The name Christian already symbolizes that you are a blessing. And through you, men Women will be blessed. Even nations will be blessed through you. That is what the name Christian stands for. But if you endure to the end, the real blessing that separates you from the cause of the creation will only come at the end of the day. And that's why Christ told this man of church to be faithful until the point of death. That they will receive the crown of life. You will be crushed but you can never be destroyed. That's why God always chooses the foolish things of the world to confront the things that are wise. He always chooses the things that are not, that are weak and the far, to confront the things that are mighty. Because he wants in everything, his name should be glorified, not you. The ultimate glory must be given to God. That's why no man on earth is qualified to give glory to himself. The church is smaller and illustrates the vital importance of endurance. Here is the endurance of the saints. Or the patience of the saints. The endurance of the saints. That is what Smana illustrates. The importance of endurance of the saints. Because without patience, no man living or dead can please God. Because the Bible told us, we have need of patience after we have done the work so that we can inherit the blessing. Do you want to inherit the blessing? You must first do the work. And what does the work say? <laughs> Let's read shortly about the church of Smyrna. 
In Revelation chapter 2 from verse 8. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 8. What does this say? Says to the church in Smyrna writes, This thing says the first and the last, which was dead, but and is alive. Which was dead, now is alive. Christ did not only speak to this man and church about their suffering, he also testified to them that he is with them. He identified with them in their suffering. That Christ also was also suffered to the point of death. And he was put persecuted, killed, and he rose again. He is alive. That's the message he sent to them. Because he knew they were in persecution. Their encouragement is that look at me. I Jesus Christ. I was handed over to the Romans by my own people, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That is the price that God was worth in the eyes of men. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, handed over to Patrick's palate, big flaws, and his skin were ripped out, and his beard was pulled out, and the crown of thorns was painted upon his head. And he was being mocked. They spit at him. And his garments parted among themselves. And they took his vesture and cast lots according to the word of God. But this is the thing. He was dead. But look at how God has highly exalted him. In Revelation chapter 1, he has the seven spirit of God in his hand. He had the stars in his right hand. Oh, he is the Christ. And he must rule until all things, all things be subject to him, including all the nation and all the kings of the earth. And that is the Christ. Do you know why? He suffered to the point of death. He endured until death. He was faithful to him that called him. He was faithful. Moses was faithful as a servant. Christ as a son was faithful to his own house, even to the point of death. Because he poured out his life unto death, he was worthy to receive the seal and to lose the whole seal that set us free. He was worthy to receive the scroll from the hand of God, to make known to all the vengeance of God. Because while he was slain, he made us king and prince unto our God. And we will reign with him on earth. This Christ was dead, but now he's alive. He is no longer the Christ that died 2,000 years ago. He is no longer in the grave. He has risen. Don't look for him. Don't look for the living among the dead. Because he's no longer in death. Oh, except a grain of corn fall into the ground and die, it abided alone. But when he died, it will bring forth fruits. And the fruit will increase the more. When Christians are set we fall down on the earth and die, we are bound it alone. But when we die, we will radiate in the beauty of the firmament. It is the body you sow is different from the body you get when you grow. We were sold in death. In the resurrection, in likeness of Christ, we shall rise in the resurrection. So comfort one another in this. Because that's why in Christianity we do not die. We sleep. Only unbelievers die because they have no hope. Christians don't die. We sleep in the Lord. And when we sleep, we shall awake just like as Christ woke up the third day. We will wake up like Him and be raised with Him, incorruptible, to sit with Him and be with the Lord and to pass no more. Affording to your belief. During difficult time, Christ said that he who endures to the end shall be saved. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 13, it is anybody that can endure to the end that will be saved. But as a Christian, are you going to give up because when you become a Christian, the pastor promised you that if you become a Christian, all your problems will be solved overnight. And now you became a Christian. Things are not working the way you plan. In fact, your business collapsed. 
you lost your job and you've been chased out of school, sickness plagued your home. Now, on contrary, like what the church told you, the many pastors have come to lay hand upon your demon possessed girl, and the demon refused, just refused to go for no reason. And the sickness cannot be cured. Are you giving up on God? Do you still hold on to your faith? Or like Job, fire came down from heaven and took away all your seven sons in a single meeting. All your property and possession were bombs in an instant. Are you giving up on God? Or do you still hold on to your integrity? Or you wake up in the morning to see that everything that makes you a man has been taken away. Do you say hold on to God? Or oh, it's time to look for an alternative source. It's time to deny God first and take a break from God and go back to your former life. After all, when you were with the devil, you never suffered any of these things. But God is asking you a question tonight. Are you faithful to death? It is only those that are faithful to death that can take the crown of life. And he said to us in verse 9, I know thy work, thy tribulation, your poverty. God is telling you, I know. I know you are a Christian. I know I promise you Abraham blessing, but I also know your poverty. I know your tribulation. I know how poverty has enveloped your life. I know despite your poverty, you have not fainted. You have kept working for me. You keep doing my work with the little money you can sustain from your labor. I know all this. Why do God look at you and say, this man is mad? Ha! Ah, how can you be a pastor and you are coming to me with your t-shirts and with broken shoes? Oh, this man is sick. But God says, I know your poverty. But to my eyes, you are rich. You might, the world might see you poor. The people around might look at you and say, this is a poor man. He does not have anything to offer. But I say to you, I know you are rich. <laughs> I know you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of the people that says to you, we are Jews. But they are not. They are the synagogue of Satan. Who are those today telling you we are the original Christian? We hold on to the doctrine. We are the only people that will go to heaven. He said, but I know that they are not. And look at it. He said, I know your affliction. I know your distress. Pressing trouble and your poverty. But you are rich. I know how you are abused and reviled. And slandered by those who say they are Jews. But are not. But are the synagogue of Satan. Fear not those things. Which thou shalt suffer. Fear not those things. Fear not those things that you are about to suffer. Dismiss your debts and your fear. Don't be afraid, even at the point of death. Behold, the devil indeed is about to throw some of you into prison. Who? The devil. God did not tempt Job. It was the devil that tempted Job. Christians should understand that. God cannot be tempted with evil. And neither does he, the Lord, tempt any man. It is when we are drawn away that we are tempted. God does not tempt anyone. But God tells you, He knows. He knows your works. He knows your patience. He knows your tribulation. He know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews, but they are not. And he also know that the devil is about to tempt you even more than what you are already bearing. He's going to throw some of you into prison. And you will have affliction. Hmm. For ten days. And what is this ten days the Bible is talking about? Ten reign of different things. And the last of all this wicked bunch was Diocletian. He was the last. The church faced tribulation ten way until Constantine when they rested. But Diocletian was the worst 
of all the church. He persecutes the church as no man. And he was the last. And he was the tenth of those kings. That afflicted the church with affliction. But God says you should be loyal. You should be loyally faithful until the point of death. Even if you must die for being truthful, die for it. And I will give you the crown of life. Christ promised us the crown of life. If we are able to successfully give our life for the sake of his work. In verse 11, he says, He that has ear. This message is intended to the churches, but it's also intended for any man that has ear to listen, that has understanding to, to hold or to understand. And he's saying, if you have ear, you should hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. If you overcome, you shall not be hurt by the second death. There is a second death. The one who died physically is nothing. It's a rest from your labor. And that's why the Bible says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth, that you may rest from your labor and your work follow you. If you die in the Lord from today, you are happy. You are blessed. You are wonderfully blessed. Because do you know why? You rested from your labor. And your work follows you. But I can't say the same for those who die outside the Lord. If you die in the Lord, your work will follow you. You will rest from your labor. And the Lord is saying to you now that blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they will rest from their labor and their work will follow them. And he says, if you hear, have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, you will not be overcome or hurt by the second death. And that is the end of our reading. Now let's go back to our message. Before we go, I want us to read quickly Matthew chapter 24 from verse 13. Matthew 24 verse 13. I read. Matthew 24 verse 13. It said, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Let's read verse 12. It says, And the love of the great body of the people will grow cold because iniquity or lawlessness we abide. Today, a lot of people love is already growing cold. Because there is so much lawlessness. If you want to see more, go travel to Africa. Go to my country, Nigeria. Go to America. Christians, the innocent have been thrown in jail. Why the guilty walk free in the streets? The reason is because Lawlessness has increased, and the love of many people is worse than cold. But you know it as a Christian. Are we going to say because the wicked are not punished, then we the righteous should do wickedly? No. The Bible says he that endure to the end will be saved. If you are able to endure this time of hardship and not do after the work of the wicked, not learn their code of conduct, you will be saved. We must hold on to what we believe. If we call ourselves Christian, we should be like Christ. The Bible says, Come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will accept you. You'll be a son and daughter unto me. But today, God is asking you the same thing. No matter the evil among your pair, no matter how guiltless the oppressed and the wicked are treated, you should not learn their way. You should not study their pattern. Not do after their law. Because if you endure to the end, you will be saved. 
Apostle Paul told us, and he wrote this, that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 24 to 27, let us read. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 24, I read. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? Do you not understand that any man that decides to compete in a race must run the whole run? He does not get halfway and say, My leg is failing me, I am going home. Or I just start running, my eyes turn me, I will not run again. You, you are lost. They will not say because your eyes is turning you, they are worthy winning prize. No. Any man that runs in the race must run up. And that's what the Bible is telling you. But one, only one, receives the prize. So run in such a way that you may be able to obtain the prize. Don't just run. You can finish the race. When the race is supposed to finish 1 minute 20 seconds, you finish your own in 5 hours. You run all the race, but you will not get the prize. That's why you must run in such a way to get the prize. Run in such a way to get the prize. The Bible says you should run for the prize. So run your race that you may lay hold on the prize. And make it yours. If you must make it to heaven, you must run the race, not like every other Christian, not like every other brother out there. Run your own so that you will get the prize. If in this world you will deprive yourself of a lot of things because you are a Christian, and at the end of the day you did not even make it to heaven, what kind of double lose have you lost in the world? There are so many things that will have make you comfortable, make you rich, you're supposed to have done. But you refuse to do any of them because you said, it is against my belief. It is against God. But now, in heaven, you are not even welcome. What lost have you lost? Of all men, you are more miserable than the killers and the kidnappers. You are more miserable than the unbelievers. If only in this world you call yourself a Christian, you have hope. Of all men, you are the most miserable. In verse 25, And every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. If you are striving for mastery, and the Bible says that every athlete who goes on into training conducts himself temperately. And restrict himself from all things. And if you also want to be a Christian to compete in the race of heaven, you must submit yourself to the training. You must be temperate in all things and restrict yourself from all things. They do it to win works that will soon be turned away. But we do ask for a crown that lasts forever. Which one do you think is even better? Every athlete that want to compete in a race, they subject themselves to rules. They go to camp. They train. They work harder than ever. They jog early in the morning before 5 a.m. They are running, doing mighty cramping. Do you know why? They just want to win so that they can have Earthly works. But what about me? We are competing for something better than earthly works. We are competing from the heavenly prize. Ought we not to run better than all these people? Ought we not to submit ourselves to strict spiritual guidelines? Put on the whole armor of God in the day, in the night, in the morning, every day of our life. Do the work of an evangelist, obtain a true proof of our ministry. Ought this not supposed to be our standard? So that we can win a crown that will last forever. A crown that must not fade away. A crown that will not perish. 
That is what God is expecting of us. And he says to us, in verse 26, Therefore, I ought you to run, to so run, not uncertainly. Therefore, I ask you, therefore, I do not run uncertainly or without definite aim. I'm not the kind of person that is running like a person that is chasing the wind. But I do not bust like breathing the air, striking without mystery. That is not my job. My job is that when I run, in verse 27, I keep under my body. I put my body to the place it belongs to. I elevate the spiritual man. Oh, when I run, I put my body in the box. I put my body under spiritual control. That the spirit man may come to life while the body dies. And bring it under complete suggestion. Lest after I have preached to others, I myself will be a castaway. Not after I have shown people the ways of salvation, I myself will be thrown into hell. I do not want that. And so because of that, I do not want to run like a person that is chasing the wind. I do not want to run like somebody that is chasing shadow. I want to put my body under complete lockdown. I want to compete for the prize. I want to fight a good fight of faith like Paul. I want to lay hold on eternal life. I want the crown of glory that the Lord will give them the love is appearing. To be given to me at the end. That is whom you should be as a Christian. This should be what you strive for. In Titus chapter 1, verse 9, the elders are admonished that they must be formed to hold fast the faithful word that has been taught. Let's read Titus. Titus 1, verse 9. Titus 1 verse 9. What did Titus say? Titus 1 verse 9. He said, Behold, we must hold fast to the secure and trustworthy word of God as it was taught us, so that he may be able to both to give simulating instruction and encouragement in sound and wholesome doctrine, to refute and to convict those who contradict and oppose it, showing the way forward and showing the gainsayer their error. In King James Version, I read, he said, Hold fast. The faithful word as it has been taught you. He that he may be able to by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. The only way you can exhort and convince the gainsayer is if you hold on to the word. Don't just teach it, the letter kills it. The insight give it light. Hold on to this word. Be instant in season and out of season. No wonder the book of the Psalms, of the summary says, Thy word has I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a light to my path, and a lamp to my feet always, to guide and to save me from sin, and to show me the heavenly ways. Let the word of God show you the heavenly ways. If your foundation is solid, in Matthew chapter 7, from verse 24 to 29. Let's read. Matthew chapter 7, from verse 24 to 29. What did Matthew chapter 7 say? Matthew 7, 24 to 29. It says, Wherefore, whosoever heareth this saying of man and doeth them, 
I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. 25 says, And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. 6, 26 And everyone that heareth this saying of man and doeth the law shall be likened unto a foolish man that builded his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the wind blew and beat upon the house, and it fell. But great was the fall of it. 28. And it came to pass that when Jesus has ended his saying, the people were astonished at his doctrine. In 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their stripes. A foolish man built his house upon the sand. He built his eyes on what his eye can see. <laughs> what his ear can hear. And he forgot that we are living in a three-dimensional world. That everything we see are just simulation. That the real world is out there. And the world is like a virtual reality. And something bigger than us encircle us. And we are just a fraction inside it. But we never understand until we are understood. Therefore, brethren, it will be wise not to build your house upon the sand. Like that fool who talks, oh, all I need is just a little oil in my lamp. After all, the bridegroom will come before 12. And so by so doing, this oil can last me till 12, 13. So let me just keep the oil on. But I tell you, the bridegroom was delayed. What happened in the bridegroom delay? Have you planned for extra delay? Did you have focus that what of if your Lord delay for extra five years? Can see your Christianity stand the test of time? If Christ did not come when you expect him to come, will your faith stand the test and the difficult trials that is coming upon the world? Or you will fall away before the day comes? Your Christianity is will be tested by fire. The Bible told us every man walks will be tested by fire. By fire you also will be saved. Any man whose works shall burn will suffer lost. But if your works survive, you will suffer gain. And the Bible says even you yourself will be saved only by fire. By fire your work will be saved. By fire you yourself will save your life. But if your works survive, and you do not, you will see suffer lost. Your work will be given to somebody else. And that's why you must hold on to your profession, to your faith, to the end. Because the Lord will come at any moment. And we don't know when he is coming. If we have no, if the good man of the house know what past of the night the thief is coming, he would have prepared. He would not have allowed his house to be broken into. But I tell you, be ready because you don't know what hour your Lord will come. And I think you take time to prove what is true. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, I read. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. What does it say? It says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And it put test, but test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. And to that, hold fast to it. Christians are not foolish followers. They are not people who are blind believers. Christians are not people like idol worshippers who are persuaded or hypnotized to believe a particular doctrine. Christians are people who test every word, who put everything they hear in a microscope to prove whether they be true. That's why Paul was happy with the Berean Christians. 
He said when they heard the word, they were not like the Thessalonica. They were more knowledgeable. The reason is because when they heard the word of God, they don't accept it on a face value. They accept it with joy into their heart, but they go home every day. The this thing the pastor say in the church, as sweet as it is, is it true? Oh, let's pray that our enemy should die. Is it in the Bible? Can I find it there? Let's pray that our neighbor should perish. Can I see it in the scripture? Is it really there? Did Christ use such statements? What did Christ do when such situation came to him? God is a God and God is not a poor God. Is it in the scripture? Can I find it? Can I really search the Bible to prove those things are true? That is a question. It's a task for you today. If you're a Christian, not willing to waste your life in the earth, chasing after fairy gold, I bet you, take your Bible as your guide. Search the scripture. The Bible says the scriptures is written, is given by God, and it's teachable for for reproof, for correction, for instruction, so that the man of God will be equipped in every good work. So make it your guide. The Bible is teachable for doctrine. Are you looking for a church doctrine to obey? Does the doctrine of your church follow the Bible doctrine? Does the doctrine of the church you abide, you are going to, does it obey the written word of God? The Bible told you the scripture is teachable for doctrine, for instruction. Do you need instruction for your business? Do you need instruction for your marriage? Do you need instruction for your finance? Or would you rather take instruction from an old judge? Or you prefer to take it from the word of God. And God is telling you today that the Bible is enough. The word of God is enough. And Jesus said, thou shalt know the Lord thy God because he is your life. If God is your life, you should listen to his word. Because his word is what gives you life. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. And the word was made flesh. And in him was life. And that life was the life of men. So we ask the word, there is no life dwelling in you. So hold on to the word, and you must study it. Prove it in everything. Check whether it is true. And if you don't test the word, you cannot know what is true. Just like orange and green, they may look the same, but they are not the same fruits. So until you test each one, you will not know which one is orange and which one is green. They may look alike, but they don't taste alike. So the word of God might look alike, but it doesn't taste alike. Test every work. Prove every man. Prove every instruction. So that at the end, you will not be at the receiving end. Because the Bible says, A man who knows not his master's will, but doeth it, he will not escape punishment. He will still be punished, but with fewer stripes. So, it doesn't matter your ignorance. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. So, if you do not want to be punished, even with few stripes, make sure you search the word. Prove it whether it is true. But if you know your master will you do it wrong anyway, you will be punished, but with many stripes. You will be prepared to endure when the going becomes very tough. As Christians, I must promise you the truth. Long suffering is a gift of the Spirit for a reason. The reason is because Christianity is not made up of rosy flowers. In Christianity, there is joyful time, there is blessing, there is favor, there is healing, there is deliverance, but there is also long suffering. There is tribulation, there is trial. You must be prepared for all at the same time. They are all in the same place. Everything in the world is yours. Whether life, death, blessing, prosperity, riches, wealth, sin, wickedness, they are all yours. And as a Christian, that does not exclude you, include you. History source reveal that Christians of the Smanas are errors believed in the millennium. The thousand years reign of Christ, the saints on earth, just like the Bible believe it. They would have nothing to do with the Roman Santumania or the Bamulia, the source of modern Christian custom. They passed and did not believe in immortal soul. They kept the Sabbath 
and the holy days, and they followed the ordinary laws of scriptures, and they climbed and fell to the Roman Empire in 15 BC, 1580. And if it is not wonder they were persecuted, they did not follow prevailing social or religious custom. Smyrna is one of the only two church to receive no correction. The lesson to the Smyrna era is simple, them, but vital and timeless. Remain faithful in trial. Endure tribulation to the end. Do not give it up. It is a lesson they cannot afford to forget. Today, that same lesson is the lesson the Lord asked me to deliver to you. Be faithful unto death. You will receive the crown of life. Where does the Bible mentions the church as mine? After the ascension, Roma became increasingly hostile towards Jesus' follower. The apostle John was arrested for preaching the gospel and exiled to Rome Pena Colony in the island of Patmos near Asia, Menor. While there, the Holy Spirit spoke to John and instructed him to record everything Jesus was about to reveal via to him via a revelation. John was there was then to send the divine dedication to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea in Revelation 1 verse 11. And the only place the Bible mentions the church at Smyrna is in Jesus' letter to the churches. To the angels of the church in Smyrna write, These are the word of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your affliction, your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slender of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will soon throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. And that is our teaching for today. Be faithful unto death, and you will have the crown of life. Do you need the crown of life in your life? Today, if you must have the crown of life, be faithful unto the point of death. And the Lord will give you the crown of life. And let us pray. This is where we end our teaching for today. For if you have just been joining this program, my name is Missionary Collins Adoge. And I am the founder of Christian Global Foundation. Teaching you today about the word of God from the word of prophecy. This teaching comes every Sunday by 5 p.m. local time and as many that can participate in this program it will teach you insights verse to verse throughout the entire Bible prophecy. We will make it known to you, explain to you the way the Bible explains it and show you the path to heaven. And the Bible said this word are not given no matter how scary or how frightening they look, they are not given to threaten you. They are given to save life. They are given so that the man of God will be equipped in every good work. And this word will be given to you so that you will learn and you will be able to teach others. The Bible says the things you have learned and received, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that is what we are doing. And God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word that has come forth. As many that has ear to hear this word, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. As many that the God of this world has planted their hearts and their ear, let them understand. Father, let the veil be taken off their hearts. Let the veil be removed from their eyes. Oh Lord, draw as many sons and daughters to yourself, because no man can come to you except you draw him. Father, as many that are sick, we ask for your divine healing. As many that are in bondage, we ask for your freedom. 
as many that are looking for the fruit of the world, we ask for your divine provision. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for our members who are able to make it, and for those who are not able to make it. We ask, O oh Lord, that your grace be sufficient for them. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is where we end our teaching for today. If you missed any of this part, you can see this video on our website. Go to cgfnslogin.app. cgfnslogin.app. You will get all our videos, our teachings on that page. God bless you as you participate. Amen.